Welcome to the Every Learner Everywhere Strategies for Success webinar series for 2024. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. My name is Norma Hollebeck, and I'm the Senior Manager for Network Programs and Services at Every Learner Everywhere. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I'd like to take out just a few minutes to tell you about Every Learner Everywhere and the mission of our network. Every Learner Everywhere is a collaboration of higher education organizations with the expertise in evaluating, implementing, scaling, and measuring the efficacy of digital learning and its integration into pedagogical practice. Every Learner Everywhere is sponsored by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And here at Every Learner, we work with colleges and universities to build capacity among faculty and instructional support staff to improve student outcomes with digital learning. Our mission is to help institutions use new technology to innovate teaching and learning with the ultimate goal of increasing student success, especially for first-generation college students, poverty-impacted students, and racially minoritized students. A quick housekeeping note, throughout the presentation, we welcomed your questions in the Q&A section found in the Zoom toolbar. If participants raise their hand, however, we will not be able to unmute you, but we will be monitoring the Q&A section as well as the chat. Now, to get to our guest speaker, I would like to welcome Dr. Carrie Diaz-Eaton. She is an Associate Professor of Digital and Computational Studies at Bates College. Diaz-Eaton's degrees are in mathematics, and their research is grounded in approaches for complex adaptive systems in evolution and ecology. They were a co-founder of CUBE's Quantitative Undergraduate Biology Education and Synthesis and the project director for Math Mamas. Dr. Diaz Eaton currently serves as the chair for the Committee for Minority Participation in Mathematics for the Mathematic Association of America. On the editorial boards for PRIMUS, Problems, Resources, and Issues in Mathematics Undergraduate Studies and Course Source, and is MAA Values Leader and leads the Institute for a Racially Just, Inclusive, and Open STEM Education, the Rios Institute. During the 2022-2023 academic year, Diaz Eaton was on sabbatical as a visiting researcher at the Institute for Computational and Experimental Mathematics at Brown University and the Institute for Mathematical and Statistical Innovation at the University of Chicago, where they were organizing programs for social justice research and data science. Dr. Diaz Eaton values the complex interplay at the intersection of her identities and professional activism in STEM education, research, and teaching. A link to their full biography and select publications can be found in the link in the chat. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Carrie Diaz Eaton. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Karen. Um, thank you so much to every learner everywhere for having me uh, today to talk a little bit about um, some of the things I do in my work. Um, and hopefully some ideas that folks are interested in maybe thinking about how this might be adopted to their own institutional and teaching uh, challenges. Um, thanks. I, I've been seeing everyone introduce themselves on the uh, chat um, while I'm presenting. I can't monitor the chat anymore, but welcome to those that, that I saw. Um, I'm going to do my own um, sort of more personal introduction. Uh, it, the professional one was great, but I want you to get to know a little bit about me and how I'm coming to this space. Um, I uh, I grew up in uh, Rhode Island, uh, just outside of Providence. And um, my, my father is from Peru, so I identify as a Latinx person uh, coming to this space. I have been publicly educated um, through my life, and, and uh, that has taken me um, as far north as Maine and as far south as, uh, as Tennessee for, for education. Um, I really got interested in sort of questions on how to save the world from a sustainability, environmental sustainability perspective, um, and was really enraptured with the idea of, of networks um, and building uh, resilient networks. And uh, I think that has been a theme that's sort of come up over and over again in my, in my lives. And that might be because I'm trying to connect with people with other shared identities, queer, Latinx, women, mothers, 
Um, I think some of the pictures that you see of me here are with some of those networks that have been so important, whether they be in biology education and, and math education or working um, back in my hometown in um, in Providence or, or you know, with my, my family. Um, and some of those have been more professional, like uh, Cubes as a, as a platform um, came together because of a desire to network build uh, folks who were teaching quantitative and computational subjects in biology classrooms um, or trying to bring biology examples into quantitative and computational classrooms and and adding that peer support to professional development to findability of resources. Um, it's just about bringing people together around common interests and using each other's expertise. So you might you might see a little bit of, of that flavor as you go through some of the things that I'm going to talk about today, uh, some of this idea of of coevolution, of peer support, and collaboration and interdisciplinarity uh, that I hope you uh, appreciate. I'm gonna start with sort of a, a big question first, you know, why, why do we invest in education? Why are we doing all of this? What do we really want for us? What do we really want for our students? What kind of world are we preparing them for? And what kind of world are they going to create? And I feel like I'm just asking questions. I don't necessarily expect answers, but I would love you to sort of reflect and take a pause. Why, for what, for whom, um, as we go through this. I'm going to throw out some of the grand challenges of the decade. These are not the only challenges, but I think these are ones that, that I've heard talked about over and over again. Um, social justice, uh, democracy, public trust of science. Um, and, and then everybody just can't stop talking about artificial intelligence. And, and I know there have been um, other talks in this series that have uh, spoken specifically to uh, advances in computing technology. I want to take a, a step and back and think about how some of these challenges might be related. So we might think about society and science and individuals as actually all, all the time interacting with each other. So this comes a little bit from my stance as an evolutionary ecologist, um, but I really feel like we are in this relationship and we are shaping each other as each other is moving forward together. So for me, it's very hard to bucket any one of these ideas. That said, I'm going to try anyway. <laughs> I'm going to try to bucket some ideas into some of these categories of individuals, of science, of society. Um, so some of those big challenges, you know, we might think about AI sitting in this like bucket of, okay, that's a science challenge. How is it going to change, you know, our future or, or the dependence we have on big data in terms of driving decision making, um, you know, climate change uh, as something to come together. And then in the past, past few years of uh, uh, COVID-19. And so, so as we're talking, you know, You'll, you'll see that I think, I hope that maybe there's some more intertangling between science and society, but maybe in the society bucket, I put social justice. Maybe I put public trust in science. Maybe I put democracy. Um, and then as individuals, we're having experiences that are consistently informed by and informing these other areas. And when you look around at the, the times we are living in, uh, I'm, I'm going to take a, a page from, from a colleague of mine, Carl Bergstrom, and he, he'd be like, this, these are the times we're living in. This is, these are the kinds of challenges we're facing. They're, 
they live in between these buckets. And here's an example very recently, uh, last week news article uh, about deep fakes, deep fake robocalls uh, imitating the president saying, oh, maybe you shouldn't show up to vote. Now, okay, AI is directly meeting democracy. And you as an individual picking up that phone and deciding, is this something that's legit or not, maybe had never occurred to you exactly before. And so these things are getting messy. They're getting more intertwined. Um, and I think my goal as an educator is to really think about why are we doing what we're doing for our students? Um, how are we giving them the skills to navigate this new 21st century? How are we giving them the self-efficacy and agency to take charge of the information that's around them? Um, how do we not feel so disempowered by, oh, well, you know, AI is going to take over our life. <laughs> you know, what are we, we going to do about it? Um, how do we get some of that power back? What are our tools? Um, who are we as individuals and how are we going to make decisions that are aligned with our uh, values? Um, and so what, what is an educator to do to try to do all of these things? I don't think there's one right recipe, but I think, I hope to entertain you with a, some suggestions about what could be at the intersection of some of these spaces. So for example, many colleges, and so I'm gonna talk primarily about the post-secondary setting. Many colleges have some kind of general education outcome. Many, many colleges have as part of this some kind of every student needs to take some kind of science literacy course. Every student needs to take some kind of quantitative literacy course, um, et cetera. And sometimes those are designed for quote unquote non-majors for students that are interested. Um, my, even though I have a very interdisciplinary background, my degrees are in uh, mathematics and Historically, it's been sort of an algebra course or pre-calculus or maybe even a calculus course um, that counts for this quantitative literacy requirement. Um, and then, of course, statistics is becoming much more popular. So when we look at these general education courses, how are they meeting the challenges that I just described? How are they getting us closer to that? Um, are they asking questions like, are, are they helping students read and understand graphs and tell stories with data? Are they helping students understand and ethically leverage computing? Are they empowering students to critique things that seem beyond their expertise like big data models and machine learning and poor and manipulative representations of data uh, and robocalls, I don't know. Are they encouraging students to think really deeply about science and science communication, especially when they invoke mathematical concepts like p-values and probability and other statistics? Are they encouraging students to explore and critique bias in science? Um, are they encouraging students to develop some kind of framing for themselves in terms of ethics in scientific practice? Are they challenging students to analyze structures of power and grapple with those structures and those decisions in their discipline uh, and in their life? Um, maybe your courses are, and that is awesome, and you are doing a great job. But if you're interested uh, in a source of um, well, maybe not what else is out there. I'd, I'd like to offer a little bit of, of what I'm doing uh, here at Bates, which is a course called Calling Bull. And this is a picture from, from me teaching the course. Um, so 
the idea is that this idea, this this exploration uh, of of what what is bullshit actually I think is uh, is a great uh, topic that's right at the intersection of of that Venn diagram that I showed earlier, and and so why? Um, well, a couple of principles. Uh, bullshit itself is not new. I mean, you know, technology is a strong part of the the thing that is driving us right now. But bullshit itself is not new. It's something we've we've always lived with in one form or another. Um, but it has real impact. It it can harm in real ways. And one of the issues is that with technology, we've amped up the reach and the impact of the bull that we see today. I forgot to put a bleep warning at the front of my talk. <laughs> Hopefully it's okay if I just use these words. Um, so, you know, our, our ecosystem has gotten a lot more complicated by technology and, and the, the possibility of doing damage. Um, there's, there's 10 times much more information, uh, 10 times much more possibility of doing damage. Ten, you know, a hundred times more people going to see it, thousand million. Um, and we're just on this overload. And each piece of this information, we have to stop and figure out, is this BS? Is it not? Are we just going to filter it and pretend it doesn't exist because it's just, I'm just overloaded. Um, so we're not always using our critical frame when, when we see information thrown in front of us, especially quantitative information. Um, and to add more to all of this, it's not just about technology and what we as individuals are experiencing, but then we also make choices in our interaction with technology. We share certain news articles with other people because the headline is great, because we have a bias to believe the, the headline. Um, we might discredit some, some individuals because of their positionality. Um, and all of those decisions that we're making, um, as a group then get built into the algorithms, um, that our technology has. So I think this is a really interesting case that really is at the intersection of individual society and science. So a little bit about the context of Bates, um, Bates College is a small liberal arts college in Maine. Um, I am in an interdisciplinary department called Digital and Computational Studies. What that means is that um, this is not computer science. We actually do not have a computer science department. This is in part the computer science department, but it's more than that. It's also the study of digital forms. It's in it has been designed to be explicitly interdisciplinary and um, explicitly with attention to who's included um, or historically and contemporaneously excluded from technology and make sure that this is a space that that's built for everyone and, and particularly for those that are that are marginalized. Um, <clears throat> We have uh, uh, appointed faculty, three appointed faculty, uh, uh, full time. Uh, one is a historian uh, by degree. Uh, one is a computer scientist by degree, and, and myself, mathematician by degree. So, so very interdisciplinary. Um, but we all work in this digital and computational space. As a department, we're committed to open education practices, meaning that. Uh, we really make an effort to have all of our, our resources free for students, textbooks, um, reading materials, other things. Uh, our software choices are, in, are, are informed by, okay, well, what is open source software? In other words, free and accessible to students both while they're at college and once they graduate. Um, open science practices, which informs our uh, uh, approach to teaching data-oriented courses, especially, um, uh, and other kinds of pedagogical practices around opening student inquiry, um, making a difference else, not just in, in the classroom and practicing concepts in the classroom, but um, showcasing work that matters outside of the classroom. Um, when I started uh, 
at uh, Bates, uh, this was about six years ago, part of a cohort hired to help build this program. Uh, I, I wanted to develop an introductory course that was going to be designed for social science students um, in particular. So I was um, talking with some individuals in uh, economics, in politics, and uh, in their disciplines, they have to take this upper level statistics course in their discipline. Um, and they, the students, once they're in their, that course, tend to struggle. There are some students that, that will struggle because they're learning everything about statistics. They're learning everything about programming with uh, a, a language called R. Um, and they're learning everything about how that particular discipline has conventions around their research and from a statistical perspective. And so that can be like a quite the entry point. Um, but actually that that's not a problem that was unique to the social some of the social sciences departments. Uh, biology was actually very similar in its needs. So I was like, okay, so what 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 100 level intro programming course can I give them this? introduction to programming, confidence and familiarity before they do something that's more oriented in their major. What can I do that really follows the philosophies of our department, gives them sort of an introduction to um, critical digital practice as well as uh, uh, computational thinking and um, and sort of uh, balance these other needs that the other departments thought were really important, like um, data visualization skills, for example, um, and then hopefully world skills, uh, like um, like the ones we just talked about before. <clears throat> so fortunately, while I was having all these conversations, I had recently just had uh, the most awesome opportunity to see a colleague of mine, Carl Bergstrom, give a talk about a course he had just developed at the University of Washington. And that course was called Calling Bullshit. So um, Carl and his colleague, Jevin West, this was just after the 2016 election, were really concerned that about this sort of narrative or the new dependence on getting information for uh, elections that was based primarily on social media. It was a real shift in how folks were gathering information and doing decision making. And that shift in our information economy was really just sort of encapsulated um, by the 2016 election. And uh, Carl comes at this from a very similar background to my own, sort of thinking about ecosystems, thinking about information. Um, and, and Jevin West comes to this as an information theorist. So what, they did this wonderful thing and, and made this um, one credit uh, set, uh, course, large lecture course called Calling Bull. Um, and then they made all of their course materials free and open for everyone. So you can get access to it at callingbullshed.org. And uh, so it's a, a series of, um, of a, a syllabus, a series of suggested readings, um, case studies, et cetera. And uh, in addition, they have videotaped all of their classes as well. And all of those videos um, are edited and put um, onto YouTube. So it's a, it's a, just a wonderful resource um, if you're wanting to think about teaching a class like this. Now that that particular class again was a, was a one credit in the sense that it, it met once a week. It was a large lecture. Um, primarily lecture-based class. Um, they do have some, some really nice case studies um, and they take that students through that in the context uh, of, of the, the lecture class itself and they have some really nice assignments. Um, but when I was thinking about, okay, well, this is really interesting content. How do I mesh that with the, the overall other goals that I have? Um, I added a, uh, additional content to it. So what I did was um, I incorporated introduction to data visualization materials, not in this like formal uh, data science kind of heavy way, but 
in a, in a light lift way, thinking about students that might be taking this as a general education requirement, I reached out um, and used materials called Figure of the Day from a, a wonderful NSF project called uh, uh, Biomap that was focused on tools for um, biology instructors to use in the classroom for students that had math anxiety. And it's just a nice, what do you notice? What do you wonder about this figure? Um, and observe, collect, draw, which is about, you know, starting first with pencil and paper, kind of drawing different ways that things can be visualized um, and thinking about it as storytelling before you jump into any kind of uh, sort of computer aided graph making. Um, and uh, and then, uh, you know, some of those actually were introduced at some of the same uh, BioQuest run conferences with with cubes. Um, so again, another great resource. Um, and, and I mentioned Carl and Jevin had done these really nice case studies, um, but uh, the students, they, they were presenting the case studies to the students. The students were not involved in digging through the data themselves. So I really wanted to do something that was really gonna build student skills and agency to get students to that point where they could really dig through it themselves. So I took their case studies and, um, and made projects around them that were all in the R programming language for uh, data um, exploration. Uh, and in order to introduce some of the R skills, I, um, I had students working through some uh, tutorials in Data Camp, which provides a, a free classroom for all students. So they you can import their courses and it's completely free for, for students to access the ones you assign them. And also they have access to the entire library if they're curious to learn more um, for the duration of the course. Um, and I, I uh, introduced tools like it, for programming in R, like R Studio and, and Colab. Um, and so my goal, and, and we had these little like exercises in class to reinforce you know, all of these things. And my goal was kind of to bring together in this really like, let's not, let's not scare you with all of the programming right away, but let's like think about some really interesting content. How might you think about leveraging programming here? What kind of information are you looking at? let's get you to look at it a little more deeply, a little more interestingly. And this is kind of the, the composition that, that I've created through all of those lenses. Um, as far as the, the content, let me just give you a, a quick walkthrough idea of what, what's included in this class. Cause it's, you know, you say I'm teaching calling bullshit and you're like, yeah, but what are you actually teaching in that class? Um, I, I'm going to start with just the overall philosophy. Um, I think community building is really important in this course uh, because we're really critiquing ideas and we got to be comfortable with that. Um, so critical practice, absolutely important. Um, I want to leverage cultural wealth. Um, this is a, an idea that sort of says students are coming into the classroom with a lot of wealth already. You're not pouring the knowledge into their heads because they're empty. Students are out there. They're interacting with information, even if they don't think they are, because some of some of them have sworn off social media, but they are interacting with all sorts of information from all sorts of directions. And, um, and they have all sorts of knowledge and interests. How do we bring those insights and those multiple pieces of view into the classroom? How do we leverage that for student engagement? So that's a really important part that I'm always thinking about. Um, and then, like I said before, I'm I'm really focused on getting them to build their skill set, um, not just because it's skills, but because it gives them the feeling like I can do this. And the next time I have information come across my plate that's high stakes or or suspicious in some way. Uh, you know, I have the agency to ask questions and do something about it. Um, we go into kind of intro with with all of these these ideas. We get them to really think about critical data practice. So introducing or or kind of reintroducing some uh, common tricky spots and statistics, but also getting really into like what is AI. You know, what is machine learning, how does it work? 
Uh, let's just open up the black box a little bit. Um, and we start talking about racism in science, um, sexism in science, other kinds of ways that people are marginalized in science, at least through some of the data that we're looking at. And then we zoom out even more to the whole ecosystem. Why does fake information propagate? Uh, why, why do we have a public mistrust of science? Well, how does science work? And, and what are the economies that drive science that can um, result in um, practice that's not ethical? And what as professional societies are we doing about this? What as individuals do we do about this? And at this point, my goal is to get them to, after being able to do these projects and think about the ecosystem and big side, uh, big ideas, I'm, I'm gearing them up to start choosing an investigation all of their own um, in the, the final part of the course and saying, okay, here is some, this, here's some information that I had thrown at me and I'm gonna investigate it and then I'm gonna communicate what I found I'm gonna reflect on my learning. And it's part of this overall philosophy of sort of open as resistance. Like let's dig in there. Let's open up the conversation. Let's not let not let's not be a passive actor in this information ecosystem. Let's take charge of our own learning, uh, of our knowledge, of our information. Um this this can be difficult to do because when I first adopted this course, I was very much thinking about the side of it that was broadly society economics. I was thinking, okay, like I'm going to have to teach, uh, you know, R for the first time, you know, I've used it in research, but it was the first time I had taught, taught it explicitly in the classroom. Um, and uh, so, you know, oh man, that's going to be a heavy lift. I was nervous about that. And data camp was actually quite helpful. I was keeping up with all their uh, boot camp uh, exercises a little bit more faster than they were. Um, but uh, that actually, that was doable. That was doable. Uh, then I thought, okay, well, I'm going to have to start teaching about AI. It's going to be like hard, you know? Okay. No, that was okay. That was doable. I had to read a lot of papers for this class uh, that the Calling Bull syllabus suggested in philosophy, in economics. Um, that was a stretch. I learned a lot about economics that I didn't set out necessarily or think I was going to, to do, but I did it. Um, I think the hardest part though has been to really think about putting the information about justice into this curriculum, not because it doesn't fit, but because it, it can be kind of scary. Am I going to screw up in the classroom? You know, am I, is somebody going to say something, uh, Am I going to handle this situation right? But I think we absolutely need to have these conversations. And here's a, an example. And sometimes, you know, bullshit finds me. I didn't go out looking for something, you know, for, for a lot of this. But here's an example of one that I, I brought to class one day because I saw it in the news. And um, so I'm just going to kind of leave this up for a second. You feel free to sort of drop observations in, in the chat, if you'd like to. What are some of the initial take home messages you get when you see this graph? This is a graph that's talking about um, pre-pandemic uh, employment levels compared to one year later. I think there are some brave folks that have spoken up. I mean, you might reflect on what is the what is the take home message of this. You might also think, well, what questions does it get you asking? It's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, the Hispanic workers. It says it may be of any race, so we don't really exactly know how the data is, you know, compared uh, uh, Hispanic and white, Hispanic and black, for example, could be could be a thing. Um, we don't, um, kind of looking at some of the other chat observations, uh, what does it mean back at work? Uh, which I think this is employment le levels. Um, you might say, look, oh, you know, 
I really thought that, and and you could be, you know, oh, gee, I'm really surprised that the the line of of white workers are just not back to work as fast. And that's a very sort of honest reaction. I think that's that's what you get out of this graph. Um, <clears throat> let me dig a little deeper into that. Here is a completely different graph in the exact same work. In this figure, now we see something slightly different. We see that we're talking about percent increase and percent decrease. Well, in this case, they're all decreasing overall after one year. Um, but instead of it being an absolute number of comparison, now you're looking at percentages within each category. Why does that matter? The reason why it looks like the folks who are white are not getting their jobs back as much as others is because there are just more white people in this data set. And so even if magnitude wise, there are still quite a few folks out of work, that is actually a smaller percentage wise than some of the other racial and uh, uh, ethnic categories. And we don't really see this until we actually see the data in a percentage format. And then this also includes information about how gender interacts with that. So now we're starting to get at questions just from looking at a figure, just from asking questions, we're already starting to dig deeper into sort of complex theory that, that's about intersectionality and, and data and how that is or isn't reflected in, in, a, in a data analysis. Here, this story tells us something different. It tells us that um, on average, um, uh, folks who in, in the census data set who were uh, identified as white or Asian um, lost similar employment uh, amounts and then those overall who identified as black or Hispanic, but within black and Hispanic categories, as well as Asian, there uh, are particularly marked differences in the return back to work of women versus men. And, and, and we can kind of almost see that the, the levels of return to work among men are actually quite similar, but um, much, much lower for Hispanic and black men. That might be enough, but we can also say, we can also maybe wonder and notice who is excluded from this data altogether. For example, where do non-binary people fit into this data set or those that classify other than men and women? Where do indigenous people, Native Americans um, fit into this data set? So, it's not just about what is there and what is presented, but what is not there. Here's a, another case study that's uh, presented um, by uh, Carl and Jevin on their website. Uh, they 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 go through two just you know case studies of very very egregious scientific studies um, that use machine learning to classify individuals. So. Um, in the the first uh, article, it's a uh, they there's a, a study that looks at a data set of uh, faces and individuals and tries to build a machine learning algorithm around that data set that can then be used to look at and identify um, who might be a criminal and who is not a criminal. Um, all sorts of <laughs> problematic things. You might just ask. Why would somebody build that kind of technology um, or be interested in that algorithm? You know, uh, but but you know, Carl and Jevin say you don't need to be a computer science expert to see to if you just know generally that machine learning algorithms are are if you put junk to train uh, a machine learning algorithm if you put junk in your, your picture data set, um, you're gonna get junk out. This is garbage in, garbage out, trash in, trash out. There's variations on this. So he just takes folks through and he says, well, let's look at what kind what kind of data they, they trained this on. And uh, 
And where did they get their IDs? Well, they got their IDs of the non-criminals from basically the equivalent of LinkedIn. And they got their training set for the criminals basically from their mugshots. And so if you look at the, the picture here from, from that, um, it, it, Carl kind of says, well, they might as well just be looking to see if you're smiling or not. What is this really testing? Uh, and then also we can ask, why would anybody ever do this study? There's a, a similar um, study that in terms of um, some egregious uh, ethically questionable study uh, trying to identify uh, folks who are uh, uh, gay from photos. Um, so trying to identify sexual orientation from a picture. And again, you might say, well, why would somebody do that? What are the consequences for that? Um, and, and, you know, that should, should be enough, but, I, but they also take this dive into, okay, what data are they using? What, what are the assumptions they're making? And if you look at the assumptions, their assumptions are fundamentally that you can say some kind of difference about somebody um, in terms of, of their identity, in terms of their character, et cetera, because of the structure of their face. And this is uh, not new age bullshit. This is actually old school, school bullshit. This, this has been bullshit that's been around for a while. As part of uh, um, a... Uh, uh, humanizing perspective that I was uh, taking in this class. You know, I, every year I go back and I say, okay, what could I do better? And one particular year I said, okay, the thing I would really like to do more of is every time we have someone named, like something's named after them, uh, some statistical test, some, some, something we're doing. If there is a name, I want to talk about that person. Um, I, and I was like, I want to humanize what's going on here. So one of the very first, um, and maybe, maybe it's the second name that we really come across in terms of techniques is something called Pearson. So Pearson uh, comes up because we start talking about uh, correlation, correlation analysis, um, because we have this module on, is it correlation or causation and what's the difference? And, uh, if you dive a little bit into uh, who Pearson is, uh, you find some really, really disturbing things. Um, so here is a quote from a, a really a nice article um, in a hist history jour historical journal um, by Quick in 2020 called The Making of a New Race. Uh, and, and, and this is a quote from that article. Uh, during his lecture, Pearson claimed that Ling, and Ling was, was a, a dog, um, when considered alongside her relatives, many of whom were on display outside the lecture hall that evening in UCL's main quad, it's a university, uh, could be understood as having unparalleled significance for understandings of human nature, racial difference, and the future of the British Empire. The dogs, he explained, represented the possibility of turning the entirety of the empire's peoples into civilized citizens. In other words, the kinds of statistics that were being developed to for quote unquote dog breeding programs had a more sinister side. The more sinister side was to justify imperialism and slavery uh, in the uh, 18 and 1900s. So we sometimes think, oh, well, that, well, but that's, that's old, that's old, right? Those, those techniques were developed because as part of this justification process, in order to, to justify uh, British imperial, imperialism um, and the way that they treated uh, their colonized people, the, the way of doing this, they said, well, we just have to get science to say it's okay. And if science says it's okay, it must be okay. And so then you go into, well, how do we get science to be okay? Well, we just have to, we just have to measure these differences. We just have to show that these differences exist between uh, dogs um, and we'll camouflage it as dogs, but it's really about differences between people. And this started a pseudoscience field called phrenology. So 
the underlying mathematics of regression of the normal distribution, um, all of these statistical concepts that are uh, important in today's big data world in that, that machine learning is fundamentally based on has this dark history of being used specifically for these reasons, which we call, oh, those, those are egregious machine learning models. But that's because that, that's actually something that should be expected given the roots, the toxic roots that this has come from. And we don't talk much in statistics class. Um, maybe some do, I hope. But a lot of times we say, well, that's that's eugenics. Oh, well, that's that's phrenology, that's pseudoscience. We don't talk about it in science class. That's that's social studies. Is it? I, I don't know. Where is it getting talked about? I think I think we all have a responsibility for talking about these things that are at the intersection of our fields. I think it's important for me to know um, that this field was developed for those particular purposes. And I need to make sure that when I'm interpreting and using my statistics uh, or machine learning models, that I am not just replicating what's been done in the past. Um, so that can be really scary. <laughs> okay, like, you know, come back to it. Like, but if we don't talk about it, what are we saying? And I think I think this is like the great counter argument for having giving ourselves the courage to start thinking about whether these topics can belong in our classrooms. Um, this is a, a study by Haynes and Patton, who are uh, educational researchers, and they did a, sort of a qualitative case study analysis on uh, a couple of different instructors who were teaching uh, courses and how they handled uh, situations that might be related to race in, in their classroom. Um, and, and here's a, a quote from their paper. Um, Faculty like Arnie, who exhibit lower racial consciousness, often exempt themselves from the learning processes and make pedagogical decisions that recenter whiteness. When that happens, white faculty maintain their position as expert. If Arnie, as expert, fails to confront race and racism, his silence communicates the minimization of race and racism. In other words, by not talking up, you're already making a political statement. Um, I'm gonna close my, my pitch for teaching this class or a class like it. Um, it's not just about student skills development, about this critical frame. I think it's also about lifelong learning. I think it's about civic engagement, digital citizenship, having a healthy relationship with science. Um, I think it's about our own learning as instructors, uh, You know how we can build the kind of classroom community we need to build to have critical conversations, learning new content, and, and being less afraid to, to stand up here and, and talk about it. Um, so if you're interested in specifically teaching this, or, or maybe you want to show this, you know, video when it comes out to somebody, a friend, and say, "Hey, you should really consider teaching this." Uh, Rios Institute is actually going to host um, a question and answer driven uh, workshop about uh, what kinds of considerations might you want to think about if you want to adopt a course like this at your institution. Um, so, if you're interested, we would love uh, to have you join us there. Uh, just a big thanks to uh, ELE um, for the invitation again, and, and thanks for uh, all of the, the folks who have been important uh, to this work. Um, a special shout out to uh, the instructional, the student instructional support team, my um, uh, attached tutors and, and research assistants, uh, uh, Sadie Kriegler and Joaquin Torres. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for such a wonderful experience. Um, this has been a, a, a great opportunity for us to learn a lot about BS <laughs> um, and that integration with the machine learning and those concepts. That's wonderful. So we really do appreciate it. We do have a couple of questions. We don't have a whole lot of time left for the questions. So we're going to kind of run through the, the top two. One of them has to do with um, the computational science 
uh, topic that you had brought up earlier in your discussion. Um, when we're looking at the, the lack of that ability for students to really understand those quantitative pieces of data, we, we also see that math scores for like 13 year olds in the US are at a historical low. And for Black and Native American students, the scores have dropped even more significantly, uh, something like 13 and 20 percent, respectively. We clearly have a math problem in the U.S. that is disproportionately harming minoritized students. Is there an, a math education need for an overhaul? Um. Yes. <laughs> I mean, and I, I think with the... There, is, there are reforms ongoing that are really fantastic and amazing. I think here it's been getting people on board and believing it. And and unfortunately, I think there's been some trust ruined by how professional development so that our teachers can appropriately reach those um, and, and uh, feel supported in reaching the new curriculum uh, demands that 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 part has not gone so well. So I think I think that's been really rough. Um, I think I think there are a couple of things. One thing I worry about in the post secondary uh, uh, context when this particular question comes up is that we kind of push the burden of responsibility onto K twelve and say, oh well, we're not responsible for low numeracy. We're not responsible. You know, we don't have to take care of that. That was they should have come to us prepared. And I think I think there are two problems with that. One is that they can have fine um, numeracy and then just not know how to apply it really well to the new context that we're talking about. And then I, I think secondly, uh, I mean, everybody keeps pushing it to the person that was before them. I think that that anybody can make that argument. Um, and and so I think both are a way of sort of saying, well, we're not responsible. We're not here to solve it. And I, I think something like calling bull it does start right at numeracy. It starts at, um, I give them this question, like if Bill Gates had all of his many, money and pennies, would it, could you pave a road to the moon and back um, and just use back of the envelope calculations, estimation? Um, is, that, is that bullshit? That, that I think he has enough money to pave his way all the way to the moon and back. Not to pick on Gates. I know there's some Gates funding, but like, I, you know, and- I don't know if I want to do a spoilers, but yes, he has more than enough money. Like he could do it in dimes, I think, and he would have enough money. And uh, and that's kind of shocking. But I, but let's start with numeracy. Let's start there. Um, I don't see why we can't anywhere. Okay. So making that connection between, like you said, we kind of pass it off and say, well, they didn't come to us prepared. What can we do in higher ed? So that even if the students are coming to us and they're not at what we are expecting as higher ed faculty and staff, um, how can we bring that in and really help them to integrate those computational um, pieces into their learnings, even if they're not going to go into the sciences? Let's say, like you said, if they're going into the social sciences or humanities, how can we really help them fill that gap, if that's what we want to call it, from K-12 to higher ed, what can we do to really make sure that that we're turning out well-educated students that that have that ability? Yeah, I think I think a lot of it is about relevant pathways. Um, that is one one answer for that. I don't think we offer enough relevant pathways. I don't think we're often great at saying, you know, this is why this information you're learning right now is so compelling and you really need it like for your life. Um, we're, we're expecting students of all walks to come and just automatically, we're going to just support them to be successful in a particular kind of environment with a particular definition of science and mathematics that they've never been successful in, probably have been told they're not successful in, and then we're just going to, you know, get them up to speed in our system. And I think that framing itself is really part of the problem. I think we need to say, what strengths and skills and interests are our students coming with? What do they need to be that, you know, to move forward in their careers? And how can we give them a pathway that allows them to do that? Um, I think that's uh, maybe 
some work in changing our reframing of, of the issue then reframes our possible solutions. Okay, to build on that, do you think that faculty are afraid of doing what would be perceived as being political when teaching math or anything? Um, I I do think that uh, for both math and science, uh, there there has been a culture of science is separate from society and math is separate and somehow pure and, and absolute and um, and and apolitical or something. I, I, to me, education is political. You cannot, we, we, political is not the same as partisan, but all of these choices we're making, every choice we make as an instructor is already political. Um, and the choice not to speak in class is also political. So you are already, in my view, you are already being political with your choices. The question is, what do you want that to say about you as a person? Um, I do understand that the climate is getting more and more hostile as a reaction to the progress we've made, um, recognizing these connections and recognizing some of the toxicity. Now, um, it's it really is, um, you know, swinging back to the witch hunt side of things and and trying to really stop the progress we've made. Um, and and some of us have the agency to do things more outwardly than others, shall we say. Um, I, I always hope at the core, one of the things I really appreciate about Rios Institute is that we provide a place where people can talk together about these issues and sort through them. Um, I don't think I'm gonna answer for you what is the right decision for your classroom, but I hope we can create communities together that we can support each other through what are really important times for our country. So we are out of time, but I really do want to thank Dr. Diaz Eaton for her time today and such an insightful discussion uh, on the BS that's out there and, and how we can kind of start working through that. Um, I would like to, for our audience, you know, thank you to our audience for being here. Thank you for being here, Dr. Uh, Diaz Eaton. Um, audience members, I would like you, if you can, take a few minutes out to complete our survey for today's presentation using the link that we're going to be posting in the chat for you. If you've got something else going on immediately after, don't worry. We'll send you the link in, uh, to the survey in a follow-through email that you'll be receiving tomorrow, as well as a link to this uh, recording. I would like to give you a brief look at our strategies for success schedule. Uh, for the series, we do encourage you to register for the remaining two sessions if you have not already done so. I'd also like to encourage you to submit a proposal for our upcoming project, The Impact of Digital Learning on Minoritized Students. You can get more information uh, on our website about that, but the bit.ly link is there on the slide if you are interested in submitting your proposal. Finally, we welcome you to visit the Every Learner Everywhere website and the resources page. All of our resources are free to read online or to download. So with that said, I would like to thank our guest speaker today, Dr. Diaz Eaton. I would like to thank our audience for taking time out to, to learn a little bit more today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week for our fourth webinar in this series in which Mark Watkins will be discussing building AI literacy with students. Have a wonderful day and we thank you very much. <laughs>